All right, today is uh, January 9th, 2014, and I'm here with Jim Carroll. This is Brent Bjorkman, the director of the Kentucky Folklife Program, doing a project, uh, part of the Archie Green Fellowship for the Library of Congress, talking about the working lives of park rangers. Jim is, uh, has been a park ranger, uh, big career in the park service, and we're here to talk with him. At, we're at his home in Cave City, Kentucky. Um, Jim, I've been talking to a few of, uh, a couple of your past colleagues and things at Mammoth Cave, and kind of started out most often with our interviews talking about, um, you know, how you got started in, in the pursuit of this job. Some people fell into it. Some people knew it from day one. What, can you tell us your story? Uh, I, I guess I kind of fell into it, so to speak. I do, I do have a, a five by seven photo here of where I went on a cave tour at Mammoth Cave back when I was probably about eight years old. And there I am, skinny little me sitting on the, on the, on the front row. I don't want to dig it up now because I'm just embarrassed. But anyway, uh, after I came back from from Vietnam, I spent about a year and a half over there, and got out of the service, and I, it was time to come back to college. And one of my friends from high school, his mother worked at as a secretary for the Division of Interpretation at Mammoth Cave. And she asked me one one evening on December, she said, Jim, what are you, what are you going to do for work this summer. I said, well, I hadn't really planned on, I hadn't really thought about it. She said, you need to work at Mammoth Cave. She said, I'll bring you an application. So she brings me an application. I fill it out. She takes it back. Well, she calls me up. She says, Jim, they're getting ready to go through applications. You need to come in and have your face and a name together. So come in and, you know, and talk to Lynn McKenzie, who's the chief interpreter. So I did. I made the appointment, came in, talked to him, you know, interested in the job. And he thanked me, and I left. Well, a few weeks later, she calls me again. She said, Jim, they've made a cut. Now you need to come back again. Make sure you put the name with a face. And so I did. And I was a five-point veteran, so that kind of helped a little bit, too. And uh, next thing I know, I was, I was hired as a, as a seasonal guide. Uh, I believe it was in 1972. That's when I started as a seasonal guide at Mammoth Cave. Mm -hmm. So that kind of got me, got me in, the, in, the, in the door, so to speak. Uh, with that little photo, I probably had been there once before, but uh, it didn't really, I don't think that really was a driving factor. But I worked there as a seasonal for several summers and really grew to like the job. I liked the park, I, you know, like the people that I worked with. And uh, when it came time to, to graduate college, uh, I had thought, well, you know, maybe this, this is a pretty pretty good career, you know, to getting in, you know, to the park service. Well, I was looking for full time, my I graduated in, a, in January, and so I was I was through with school, had a bachelor's degree in business administration, and so uh, I was at applying different places. I had had applied several different places, especially winter parks, that sort of thing. And I got a call from Biscayne National Monument. That's before it was a national park, probably just one step up when it was was Homestead State. It was a Homestead County Park, is what it was before it became a national monument, then a national park. And a fellow down there, Don Weir, was chief rancher, and he hired me to, to go down and, and uh, to be a law enforcement and on boat operations there in, in the water. And I asked him later, I said, why did you pick me? And he said, you're the only one in the application that said you'd even been on a canoe. You'd been on a canoe on Green River. He said, I figured I could teach you. If you weren't afraid of water, I could teach you how to, how to uh, uh, operate a powerboat. So that, then I went down there, worked down there for about nine months. What was that job? What, what? That, was, that was primarily law enforcement on the water. And because at that time, Biscayne had 100,000 acres and 5,000 was land, the rest of it was water. Now it's like over a million acres and most of that's water, very little land. It, it's, the boundaries have been expended, extended quite a bit, north, south, and no. all. Still goes out to the blue water, but that pretty well took care of it. So I was down there, but that time I missed a summer at Mammoth Cave. Then I came back to Mammoth Cave, and then I hired, I hired back in again as, as a summer seasonal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you'd grown up around here. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I grew up. I moved to Mumfordville, which is not about thirty miles from the park, uh, when I was ten years old. Came in from Virginia. Okay. So that first job, um, the Biscayne, we know the. The jobs at Mammoth. How did you progress? And you had this law enforcement experience, and where did you start to fall in here? Well, at, at Mammoth Cave, 
I started working as a tour guide again and one of the superintendents uh, let's see I guess it would be before Bob Deskins and after Joe Caliza uh, I can't think of his name right offhand radon radon had become an issue with the tour guides and so a way to diminish that was to rotate people in and out well what they did they put up they came up with split positions you'd work four months in law enforcement four months in, in, in the cave as a guide and four months as resource management so when that came up uh, the applications you know were out and and I was sitting at the coffee shop one day with Henry Holman who was who was a long-term guy at Mammoth Cave and uh, he said, you know, are you going to put in? I said, well, I don't have much of a choice, I, I, much of a chance. I said, I think you and Joe McGowan have got a you know, bigger chance over me. You've been around here longer than I have. He said, you ought to put in just to show interest. Well, I put in, and I was selected as the first one, probably because I was a five-point veteran and they weren't. But, uh, but they were hired in soon after, and that's where a lot of the tour guides then became splits, as we called ourselves. And you worked law enforcement, resource management, and back in, you know, interpretation doing the guy for a for a chunk of time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that and that kind of gave me a taste of the other things but I had worked law enforcement at Biscayne see that also had given me a, a leg up too because I had had a law enforcement training down there mm -hmm. actually during that one time I came back to the Great Smokies for a week of law enforcement training and you know while I was at Biscayne so it was and we then we did law enforcement training down there as well so at that time I, I had what what law enforcement credentials they had, I had all of it. Mm -hmm. So you had the law enforcement, you had the interpretive. Interpretive side of it, and I'd work some resource management, which basically was, it was, was you know, walking trails, working trails, and, you know, trail, trail erosion, that sort of thing. Did that stay that way over time? This, this, this... I said it lasted for several years. It lasted for several years, and then they kind of got out of it. I think there was a concern about supervisors you may you may have worked for three different supervisors in the course of a year. So who does the evaluations and who, you know, how do they, how do they coordinate all of that? That was kind of that was kind of foreign to them. And it it's somewhere in that time. Uh, I think it was Bob Deskins came up and you know and, and wanted to uh, do a a safety position full time safety position and. I put in for that and was selected. And so I, I came in into that as a 579, GS 579, but it was part time. And somewhere before he left and went to Atlanta to as deputy regional director, he decided to make everybody, you know, as one gift. If you want to be full time, we're going to now bless you. You're going to be full time and not part time. So a lot of us part timers became full timers as, as he went to Atlanta. Which he came back on operations evaluation and dinged us for it, but he laughed about it and went on. But, uh, but it, it was it was a way. It was again. It was it was a, a different superintendent, and then there an, another another John. That was safety con, uh, con, considerations that I did. You know, all the occupational safety health for the park, and then another superintendent came in, and a person left, and concessions operations came up, and that was the, the people that operate the hotel, the bus the bus trips, the, you know, the stores, and, and the, it was Miss Green River Boat Ride at the time. There has to be a park service liaison that handles that. You know, it's a contract represented between the park service and the, and the concessioner. So I went, I, I had been doing safety evaluations and I had been aware of what the other was and nobody else in the park did. So I was kind of a natural whiz in, so to speak, to, to, to do that. And so I was selected as safe, I was doing safety and concessions. And I did that for a couple of years and then got a, that was as a, as a GS9, and then got a desk audit. And the desk audit showed that the safety was a, was a nine position and the concessions was a nine position, all on its own because of dissimilar information and things that you had to do and skill sets. So when they, when they do that, then they combine them, that makes you a GS11. So Superintendent held that for a year, and so I got I got a GS eleven out of that. So I'm you know, there's a guy that's been to one other national park. And then later it, it goes into from from that from safety and concessions, 
to where uh, Ron Schweitzer came in as a superintendent, and he wanted to do something totally different. He wanted to do an, a division of external programs and communications. And nobody, I mean, that was not, that's not a standard park service position or division by any chance of the means. Mm -hmm. nobody, and most people have never heard of it, but he wanted to do it because he, he wanted these things done and he didn't want them scattered all over the park. He wanted them done, he wanted me to handle it. He, you know, I guess we had a relationship, you know, it's a decent relationship and he, he thought I could handle it and, uh, you know, I'd work closely with him and get get the results that he wanted. Because what we did, we, we pulled Vicki Carson, who was interpretation, pulled her in as public information officer, and that's what she's been doing ever since, and she does a bang-up job of that. Then there was Trey Seymour, he was an interpretation, uh, but he was he was doing guided tours, and then he was piddling around with the computer. Well, I'd say piddling around, that's really not a good, a good word for him, but he wasn't able to be dedicated to do what needed to be done. Well, he's a he's a he's a he's a whiz with it, and he he's the one that's done all of our public so all of our publications, website development, all that sort of stuff is done by him, and so that all of that came under my purview as well, not that do it, but to supervise to make sure we got the results out that that we were looking for, and it was done like we wanted it done, and then later it came up not too far after it came up in communications, well, here we want to do uh, we're going to. We were just starting into IT, information technology. It was a new word. Nobody knew what it was. Well, yeah, we got phones on the desk. So what? Phone company takes care of them. Well, not anymore. And then there's, you know, your computer. What's it linked to and where does it go and how does it work and who repairs it and all that sort of stuff. So the IT came in there and I wound up hiring two people, uh, Matt Arnold and Pat Price, who are still there. And both of those guys, I just, you know, they're just, they were great. I mean, nobody, you know, nobody could do what they've done the way they've done it. And, and they, you know, they brought the park, brought the park from plug-in uh, telephone modems to uh, fiber optic wired communication systems with, you know, with all its routers and, and, on, and all the necessary equipment to make that work according to park service standards. Uh, you know, we were running fiber, op getting ready to run fiber optic cable. And we said, well, Somebody's got to, got to, got to do the ends on, on this fiber. You know, this stuff is about the size of a hair. And who's going to do it? And Matt said, well, he's a fine scale modeler on his own, own right. And he said, I can probably do that. I said, well, let's buy a kit. You can buy, you can buy a kit to, to do that, to polish the ends of them. And I said, if it works out, I said, we'll, we'll buy a good kit. But just buy one to get us by and see how, it, see how it's going to work for you. The next thing I know, we're buying the big kit and we're off and running. So we ran fiber optic all over that park. And our people, you know, it was all done in in house. And you know, we had maintenance guys, we had crews that would go out and run the cable underground. Then our people would, would terminate it, would run it into the houses, the buildings, up, up to each user, and get it working. Do so, you think this kind of expansion that that you're speaking that Ron kind of did and and went, is that something that was, as far as you know, with your colleagues around the country, was that something that was em emulated or or uh, uh, something that was done in other places? I, I don't know. I, m most people, <clears throat> he had me talk to several different superintendents about what it was. I, th I think our region allowed him to do it. If It said, Ron, if you've got the money and the, and the staff to do it, do what you want to do. They backed him. And a lot of, you know, I don't know that many other parks wanted to take that stand. Now, that's the things that we were doing in the park, but we also, I wound up, I spent a lot of time with Ron. We did a lot of the external communications from the standpoint of local, state, and federal government relationships, and as well as uh, tourism. You know, the state, local tourism, and national tourism organizations, that sort of thing. We did, we did all that coordination as well. We we go to all the all the trade shows, travel shows, uh, in the state anyway. We didn't too many national ones, but we went to those. Uh, and just you know, we were we were make sure that people knew that we were Mammoth Cave, and you know we were we were here to to you know to be part of the players, not you know, and just you know we were we were available, and, and you know anything we can do to help you, we'll try to do it. So these are a lot of big changes in your in your like maybe let's say last half of your career. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So that we I, I did that for ten years. It was, I think it was uh, that's about seventy nine. No, it's longer longer than that. Probably eighty nine. Well, because I've been out for about six years now. So, but, but I did that for about ten years, ten eleven years, and then when I retired, 
the way things were going at that point, when people retired, then there just weren't the funds to keep a lot of positions. You know, a lot of the job titles, a lot of the jobs that went out and went to different people, different places, or some things were just weren't done. But you know, it's like one thing that, that I did, I put together a, a congressional liaison, and each fall we would invite all of the state coordinators from all the uh, federal senator and congressman's offices to come in for a day and basically we would sit down and just chat with them and say this is what's going on in our world you know do you have questions you know what can we help you with i got to where with uh, senator mcconnell's uh state coordinator he'd pick up the phone and, he, and you know he'd call i could call him either way that, that's the sort of relationships that we were trying to make is that if i had a concern or he had a concern or anything that we could help each other with you know then we would we would do it it's like he told me one time he says yeah he said if i send you a letter and asking for this. We, we attended uh, Kentucky Tourism Council meetings, uh, became active members. Actually, Mick Holm, Ron Schweitzer, and myself were the first three with Kentucky Tourism Council to have the, to be part of their management professional development program. We were the first ones that got the, that did did the requirements for that. So it kind of helped their program to get get them started, and we we. We had things that we had we were cooking with, and it fit their agenda. So you know we we worked it that way, and it it worked out good. I mean it was, it was a it was a good pat on the back for both of us. You know, been doing it that way. Mm -hmm. But uh, but you know even getting out with with other people, uh, we also had the volunteer program, VIP program, was in my in my section as well. Uh, Marianne Davis was doing that at the time. Tell me about that. Well, the volunteer program was you know to get trying to get people interested in coming to the park to help us do some things that we need help with you know it could be all sorts of things it's uh the volunteer program helped uh, instrumentally with the uh, trail around the beaver pond sloan's crossing pond as we, as we now call it all of that was with target store employees and we had american airlines and i don't know who all else donated money and, and lumber and that sort of thing and then a lot of the target store employees came down on their own time and did, and did a lot of the work, and they've done other a lot of other projects at one time in the park. So there was a lot of you know a lot of people coming in to help us with with major events. Uh, we also probably never done by any other national park, I don't guess, but we 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 did uh, juried art shows. Now, if you remember those, we had an uh, Earth Speak program, and we had we had a lot of the different activities going on with that. Uh, and one of them was a juried art show, and I think uh, people that know state politics, Crit Llewellyn came down and was our was our juror one year, and just tickled to death with it, and just had no idea we were doing that sort of things. Well, normally you don't. I mean, national parks don't do that sort of thing. Uh, but Ron Schweitzer had an interest in the arts community, and so he wanted to do it. Well, he's a superintendent; he can pretty well do what he wants, and so that's, we did that for several years. Uh, you know, some people said good things about it, and some people didn't. So, but it was it still worked out. The, the artists that took place that took place in it, they were local for the most part. They were Hart County, Warren County, Edmondson County, all local, and so that helped to bring bring people together again. You know, with the park, and that was that was kind of the, the main objective of it. What are the relationships between <clears throat> park people that work at the park rangers and things and and the local. I think every place that has a national park certainly has its own story about when the park was established and the local people. And that's, but over time here, um, there people that had lived here for many years. Did they? There's a lot of people that worked at the park that were from this area. I mean, do we have a do we have a more proportional amount of people that are from this area that work here as opposed to others that may have people just coming in and are seasonals from this area or do they come from all over and well the, the I think uh, you find a lot of a lot of employees are from the area not you know not all of them of course but there's a lot of them that are uh, and it's you go back to when the park was established you hear a lot of different people say a lot of different things about the establishment of Mammoth Cave there were 600 small farms and a lot of the land was, was used pretty hard. There wasn't a lot of standing timber. It had already been cut and sold for railroad ties or whatever else. And so people 
they, you know, we all hear that they were offered market value. Well, you know, market value may not be able to give you money to go anywhere else and do anything either. So depending on what the value is and how that works. But I know my wife's family uh, is a John's family. And up in the northeast corner of the Green River, their property, part of their property was taken as part of that. They didn't want to sell. They weren't, they weren't willing sellers, but they had to, it was condemned and they had, they had to take it. And, and if you look at the boundary line up through there, did they have to take the house and the barn? No, they could have moved it over a little bit and not taken either one of them and left the farm pretty well intact, but it busted it up. And so they, they moved off and sold off and you know, they were gone. So it, it's, you know, those, a lot of things, you know, and there was a report of a, a, a ranger that riding on a horse that nobody liked, and I understand, may have gotten shot at one time, you know, it's, you know, I've, I've heard that, I've heard, I don't know that personally, but, you know, I, I've heard that. And, you know, and it depends on how you, how you treat people. And I think where we were trying to come from is trying to open up and, and be warmer and more friendly to, to the local folks. Uh, at one time, we had a chief interpreter, and I won't say who it is, uh, he wanted to get rid of all the locals that we had doing cave tours. He didn't like them. Uh, and I, I had I had a distinct pleasure one year to supervise one of our longest term seasonals that I think is still employed at the park. And what he wanted me to do was to give him a put him in put him in competition for rehire rather than keeping him above the, the, the competition pool. He wanted me to put him back in the competition so they could overlook him. Well, this same person we had brought in the winter before during Christmas vacation and had him do video for our new seasons to see this is what we want. This is our idea of perfect interpretation. This is what we want people to do. So I asked him, I said, you want me to tell this guy he's back in competition? I said, it ain't going to happen. If you want it to ha if you want to tell him, you tell him. He, he gets he gets evaluation that I, that I see he needs. And I went with him on a couple of trips, never let me down. You know, never went with him again. Didn't have to. Knew what he was. He helped train me. Speaking of interpretive training, you know I've done a few interviews now and thinking about how I've had people talk a little bit about the change in what the Park Service would like to have or how did how has interpretation changed from the old school interpreters? Uh, we ha You know, we've had interpretation in the park for close mm -hmm. to 200 years in different forms of fashions, but... How has it changed over time um, and, and what we're trying to get across to the public and why has it changed? Over well, I, th I think a lot of that, when I started, you went on other tours with the old time guides and you listened. And there was some, there was some guide manuals and a few things to look at, but not a lot. And you really didn't have time to go out and do your own research. I mean, you, you picked up what was there and that, that's what you went with. And but if some if you weren't telling if you weren't telling it correctly, then somebody would straighten you up. Maybe maybe not in front of a group, of course, but you know sometimes they would they would tell you what's going on, what's good, what's not so good about what you were doing. And the supervisor would do that when they went with you on a tour. So, but that was what's and I and I'll give the credit to probably to Joy Lyons a lot. I and mean, when she stepped in you know, into interpretation. She, matter of fact, I was her first supervisor and I put her back in competition, by the way. But anyway, for the first year. And and she, she did, did tell me that she appreciated that because it woke her up. But anyway, she's encouraged people to do their own research and to look beyond just what the old guys were telling. And so, it, you know, it's brought up a whole new realm of information that was available to us. You know, what did we know about the black history at Mammoth Cave? Not a lot, not a lot. I mean, we we knew that, yeah, they went in the cave. They were they were guides. But what else did we know about? Do we know anything about their family? No, we didn't. So you know, the the, the new interpretive, you know, and I say new. That's probably within the last fifteen years. I mean, they they're finding out more about it and how it you know, and finding out more about the truth of what what it really has been. And has it changed a whole lot? Yes, because I think it gives people more information, more knowledge base to, 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 to develop their talk from. Because your spiel that you give on the tour shouldn't be like anybody else's. We had one old fellow, and I loved him to death, was Shorty Coates, was an old-time guide. And 
if you've got him on the tour and he was in the middle of, a, of, of one of his talks, if somebody interrupted him and he lost his train of thought, he would immediately go back to the first word and start again and spit it all right back. No matter if he was halfway through it, you got the first half again. But that's just, that was him. You know, so take, take it for what it was worth. That was him. And he gave you a good tour. But it was, it was, it was pretty well, uh, it was a tape recording, but he was good. Right. <clears throat> what I think is interesting is this idea that, and you mentioned a little bit about working with concessions, but right before this last question, you talked about how the community that was either displaced or, you know, how do you work better with communities? And I think about you talking about your career, you seem to be a people person or understand it or want to make these connections. How was it working with concessions? Did that, did that change over time? Maybe if you know any happened before you, I'm just, I'm just curious about that culture working with the concessionaires. Well, I, th I think a lot of that has to do with the personalities. Uh, when I started working with the concessions operation, Garner Hansen was alive, and he, he was the principal person in national park concessions, and they operated in several different national parks. They even, even when the Park Service needed somebody to get, like, go into Death Valley, and when, when that concessionaire went belly up, they went in there and started the operation and, and, and made it work, you know, at the Park Service's request. Now, lots of times they, they were doing things like that. Uh, but when there were times that the superintendent and, that, and Mr. Hansen wouldn't see eye to eye, you know, they, they, they'd bust heads. It'd be left up to me to try to kind of soften the blow between the two of them so we could get along. Because I would be doing the, uh, the uh, inspection reports, the safety and the concession reports. I mean, they're, they're detailed things that have to be done periodically, uh, you know, for the concessions operation and contract compliance and that sort of thing and year-end documents and looking at the financial reports and, you know, that sort of thing. And for the, but for the most part, the concessioner tried to do what the Park Service wanted I think the concessioner's problem was that every time we got a new superintendent, the direction changed. By the time they get something going and working and got used to it, then we want to make another change. And I, I, I totally could see that, but I was caught in the middle of that one. You yeah. know, so we try. I would try to soften it as much as I could, coming from either direction, mm -hmm. and, and try to make it work. Because the end result is what kind of services are we providing to the public, and are they affordable? You know, that that's that's it's, we want to have the best best services in for the for least costly amount of way of doing it. Mm -hmm. So that, that's that's what that's what's kind of guided me on, on working with the concession operation. Knowing that we had an, an older infrastructure, I was there uh, actually before I was doing concessions work, I was I was law enforcement and there was the old hotel. Now the second not not the first hotel that burnt way back in the in the teens, but the second hotel that was taken down in seventy nine. I was the I was the ranger fire guard assigned to that building at night, all during the nighttime, to make sure that if it caught fire, everybody got out. That was my one sole mission: make sure if, if it catches fire, get everybody out. I asked my supervisor, I said, "Do you want me to then go get the fire truck?" No, just get everybody out. That's what they wanted. They want everybody safe, and that. For some reason, the and that was a, that was kind of a thing between the park service and the concessioner. Could it have been mitigated differently? Perhaps, but it wasn't. So, you know, that that building had to come down because it, because the park service requested. It. Could you have gone in there and put sprinklers in it and done this or that and the other? Maybe was it worth it? I don't know. I I, I wasn't into that end of it at the time. It's just you know it was a, it was a delightful old building. If it had caught fire, it would have gone in a hurry. Just like the, like the previous one did. They said the previous one back in the teens that the blaze could be seen from Cave City. That's quite a ways away. How has law enforcement changed over the time that you started? Can you kind of give me an overview of of, of that progression in your mind? As you well, I, I you know I, not not been in the law enforcement or that close with it at the park uh, in the last you know most recent years. Uh, when I was at Biscayne, the first first chance of doing any law enforcement, they taught us. They we get we had some basics. We had uh, uh, had to go to the pistol range to shoot. You know, and they gave you several courses of shoot, no shoot, that sort of thing. 
but we didn't get we didn't get a lot of constitutional law and things that you can do or can't do that sort of thing. We kind of kind of winged that one, and not until I, I actually got a forty hour course at Smokies when I was at Biscayne, went up there and, and took a training course, and I learned more more of the of the, of the constitutional side of it. Uh, and then when with Mammoth Cave, we were always doing in house training uh, there. You know, every year you you did you did forty hours every year. And lots, we were, lots of times we couldn't afford to go somewhere, so we'd bring people in. We'd structure the training, and we'd do it in, in a house. And, of course, everybody got back, back on the pistol range and that sort of thing. But for the most part, it was, you know, I, I guess a, a thing that I always remember sticks in my mind is that we did a, a, a practical pistol shooting, and there was one thing, shoot or don't shoot, and, and there was an image of a police officer. He had his badge in one hand, and he had a gun in the other, and he turned on me. And you had, you were, this was a movie screen, and you shot these little plastic bullets. And he, he comes around like that, and he's got this grin on his face, and he pulls his weapon around, and he levels it at me, and I shoot him. And the guy stops the camera, and I said, well, I guess I blew that one. He said, no, he said, you're the only one who got it right. He said, he was going to shoot you. He rolled the camera, and he did. He said, he's one of the bad guys. I thought, well, how, who would who would have figured that one? I figured, well, I, but the guy would love. I was watching the gun. I saw the badge, but I was watching the gun, and that's, you know, that, that's. But still, I, I still remember that, even though I don't do law enforcement. The law enforcement seems like it's maybe a little bit more. I see. I saw them at the park, and lot, the guys had uh, full Kevlar and their Glocks and. Th I, had law enforcement had they always been that that decked out in, in, in equipment and when I when I was at Biscayne we had uh, stainless steel revolvers and we carried them usually in a brief a leather briefcase on the boat because where we were at we got sprayed with salt water constantly and the gun stainless steel will rust and we didn't get into that many high you know high confrontational issues at the time. For the most part, at Biscayne, it was, hey, this is now a national park. You can't do this. You can't do that. We're going to give you a courtesy tag. You know, we're going to record that we talked to you and got your boat number and that sort of thing. But, you know, we're going to let you go. You're not, not, you know, no, no big deal. But if it happens again, then we might give you a citation. But we were, we're, all we were trying to do is educate people that it was now a national park and you couldn't pick up small spiny lobsters and start in, in you know, uh, tropical fish and, you know, all these sort of things. You had to just leave everything. There's sea fans and all that sort of thing. And the corals, you had to just leave everything there. That was that was a new thought process for everybody. Back at, back when I was at Mammoth Cave, we went through law, the law enforcement training, uh, and at the time we carried revolvers. That's what everybody carried. And, you know, the, 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 the Glock pistols, the automatic pistols are, are, you know, relatively relatively new. I mean, 12, 15 years, I don't know, maybe more than that. But the training has even gotten better, I think, because it's not, it's more, the law enforcement is more technical than it ever used to be, I think. You know, you've got, I remember when, when the Miranda warnings, you know, you had to give a Miranda warning. You had, to, you had to give people their rights, and there were certain things you could do. You know, you, you didn't just stop somebody and bail them out of the car and then tear the inside of the car out to go look for something just to see if they had anything. I remember as a kid at Mumfordville, there was a, constable that would stop people. The interstate stopped at Bonneville at the time and at Mumfordville they would come through and I hung out at the Shell Station out there as a kid. You know, I was 15, 16 years old. And the constable, if you came through with Michigan plates and you were black, you got stopped. And he tore in your car. We watched him and night after night. If you had beer in your trunk, you, you were going downtown. If you had a knife or gun in your car, you're going downtown. He'd take you, he'd arrest you, take you downtown. You'd pay your fine, and he'd bring you back and send you on your way. Well, that constable couldn't write his name, so he had to have somebody with him write the ticket. And everything that he was doing is illegal. I mean, just illegal as it could be. So that, that's where Miranda really needed to be in, in that sort of thing. That's about the time, shortly after I saw that, that's when that, that, that kicked in. So there, you know, you don't you don't find that sort of thing now. The Park Service, you know, the, the Rangers are they live to a pretty high standard, uh, and you know, they said, well, do you really have high crime? You may not have a lot of it, but you have the same issues every that you find everywhere else. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no real difference because you got the same people. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> 
you mentioned we mentioned before that um, another thing that's been interesting for me is to find out about. I know that your wife wasn't connected to this, but there were a lot of people that either met or that, you know, and and that's interesting. Or maybe speak to that. Or you also mentioned to me when you were showing me a couple of uh, pictures that uh, your daughter was working as a mm -hmm. seasonal person. Mm -hmm. Is tell me about how that that worked out in, in your in your in your family example or other examples of of things you've witnessed in your career well yeah you know, like you're you're right my my wife and i did not meet at mammoth cave she never worked there and she's not really interested in being underground she, she's a little bit claustrophobic like her mother is she's like so that's you know it's really not a mammoth cave tie with her it's been totally separate from that my daughter on the other hand she was i think 14 and decided she wanted a summer job, you know, to, to earn some extra money. And she went out and she got herself a babysitting job for the summer. And she really didn't like it. And then the next year at 15, she went, she was said, well, I'll, I'll try it one more time, you know. And so she got this one little girl that she had to keep that was just rotten. And I think my daughter may have had some instinct to hold her head under the pool at some time, down under the water. But anyway, she didn't. And she said she came home. She said, "I'm gonna I'm gonna go down and the computers in the basement with a printer, and do a resume." And then she had her mom take her around, and she took her resume around at age 15 to. Uh, to to. Uh, Take the, take the resume around and give it to different people, different places she could work. Well, one place that she went to was the American Cave and Karst Museum in, in Horse Cave, ACCA. Well, she knew a lady up there, Peggy Nims, who had also worked with her at Barron County Middle School. So she, Hannah was kind of a known in, known with, with her. She was known. And so she, you know, applied, and Peggy hired her at, 50, at the age of 15, to be a, a seasonal interpreter up there. So she got her first tour, cave tour guiding experience at, at Horse Cave. And then she did that for several, several years. And uh, when once she went to went to UK, she came home, she said, what do you think I, chances of me getting on at Mammoth Cave? I said, give it a shot and find out. And of course, with that previous experience and then the, the reference, Peggy's well known in her circles, you know, the interpretive circles, and so Hannah was hired in, and the picture that you were talking about is hanging on the wall here, and it, it's a picture of my daughter and myself at the natural entrance. That was my about, about my last winter before I retired, and she was coming in working, I think, Christmas that year, working the Christmas break during schools out. So it, she, you know, she and a lot. And there's several staff people at Mammoth Cape had children, had an interest in it, and came to work. I think. Uh, Vicky and Bobby Carson, their, their daughter Cecily, is, is working at the park. Uh, but there's several chances of summer jobs that have been available, or even if they just chose not to go on any any beyond that. Hmm. So it's it, 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 it's a little, little different for some people, but it, it worked out well. Mm -hmm. is, is Mammoth Cave known as a training ground for people that maybe go on and... You know, I've talked to a lot of people that are, are from this area, have jobs here, have always wanted to work here. I feel very lucky, those kinds of things. But, I mean, it sounds like you have a really good training program, and people, is it a place that's known or has been known that you get a really good education in this, and then they maybe go on to other places in the U.S.? I, I think, I think uh, in the interpretive circles in the Park Service, if you've worked some time at Mammoth Cave, it, it, it bodes very well for your experience that you can do structured interpretation and you you know you can you can speak on your feet, you know that that's one of the hardest things to do is you know can you can you run and gun can you talk walk and talk at the same time and you know and carry on and carry on a program, but yet not not feel like it's a canned program. Can you learn can you learn your subject and then give it back to people in a, in a, in a method and a format that, that that they want they want to hear that they liked. I think that's 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 the thing about Mammoth Cave. It's it's giving you. It's giving you the, and it gives you the authority. You, you, you're, you have to understand, you know, when you first take a tour, one of my first tours that I guided myself, it was a, what was called, at the time it was a half day tour. And it was, it's a four mile trip. And we, usually we split the group at the entrance. We took 240 people, is what we were taking at the time. 
and go to the snowball room one mile, then let people get a chance, something to eat or whatever, drink, and then you assemble your group again, you, and you take off from there and go another three miles to go out. And so uh, you find that that at first, I think I'd been on that trip four times, and the, and the fellow that was leading the, leading the group, he says, Jim, he said, how many times have you been on this trip? I said, four. He said, don't you think it's time you got it, let, let out? So I did. I had no idea where I was going. Which way. First time I'd ever walked in the front of the tour. And I said, which way do I turn? He said, just follow the light switches. He said, every time it gets dark, look for another light switch. And, you know, and, and that's, that's, that was not the first time I actually, quote, got on the rock, as they call it. And, and it's the fourth time I've been through there. I'd been, you know, you got to start sometime. And, but, you know, as, as, you, as, you do, as you develop your interpretive technique, you first of all, when you first go through there, you don't know anything, you don't have anything to say, and you're just scared to death what's going on. After a while, you get to where, well, I know all this information. Everybody wants to know all of it. So you, you, you burn them to death with how much information you can tell them, and, you know, then, then there's, you know, you're not reading them and you're stamping the ground trying to get out of there, and you're still talking. Well, and you finally realize, wait a minute, what you've got to do is hone this down to something that's, that's appropriate for the group that you've got. Hopefully you can feel what they're interested in by questions or whatever and give them. But, but don't keep them at one spot over in about five minutes. That, that's a long time for somebody just to stand there and look at you and then move on. If you want, you know, if you can make smaller, you know, more frequent trips or stops, do that. But don't, don't, don't just talk just to be talking. And I, I think the third stage, when you finally get to the third stage, take, it takes a while for it to, but I think everybody that goes through that, through that process. But, but it's pretty slick when all of a sudden you, you, you have the information, you're comfortable with it, and then you're, you're, you're able to answer people's questions and give them the, the feedback that, that you think that they're looking for. Have you had some pretty crazy questions or some crazy incidents that have happened that you've, interesting, funny, scary, that you could share? Only, only one that's really was bad what happened to me I was guiding the lantern tour. It's me and 40 people with kerosene lanterns and uh, one other guy. And the other guy on the lantern tour, lots of times the other guy would go on up ahead or go looking at somewhere, looking in the rocks or see what was up in there or be in the back, whatever, and stay way back in the back. I had a kid, I let a small child carry my lantern. I guess he was 10 or 12 years old. And rather than me carry it, and I had my torch bucket, my torch stick, which we were throwing torches at the time. So it gives you some idea how old it is. And the kid turns, talks to mom and daddy. I go in the dark. And next thing I know, I step off the edge of the trail and fall probably about four feet down. Scraped up my arm, my, my, my head a little bit, and, and, the, and my uniform. I'm in, I'm in a standard uniform, but now that gray shirt is black from all the soot and smoke and everything, and there I am, and it's red because I'm bleeding and all that sort of thing. I'm not really hurt per se, but embarrassed more than anything. And so I called for Bill Ritter, he was the, he was the other guy, and I called for old Bill to come take the group. And he took the group and went on out with him, and I turned around and went back, and I caught some pretty awful stares coming back out, out of the cave, there I am all dirty and black and, and bleeding and everything else. And then Lewis Cutliffe, he was the chief guide at the time, he got up there and he's, he's called me Candy ever since that. And I, I won't use the last part of the word, but uh, he got some green soap and he scrubbed me. I mean, it stung like a doubt. He said, this will fix it. And in about two days it scabbed over and I was, I was you know, I was, in, I was in good shape. So the green soap and the scrubbing worked. So. And I was more careful. I didn't, I didn't give my lantern away anymore. More careful about it. But just one quick moment, and that, that can happen to you. So yeah. that was, but that was more embarrassing to me than, any, than anybody right. else. And you're such a man of safety anyway. Maybe. Well, that, that, maybe that's why they made me the safety specialist. I don't know. <laughs> um, what do you think about the evolution of who's being hired? And I mean, are people coming into this job? What kind of advice do you give to people that, might think that they, any facet of this ranger life is, is for them. How do you, what kind of advice would you give them if they came to you and knocked on your door, or talked to you and said, you know, I heard you were a park service person, you know, what, would, what advice would you give me? First is like, don't, don't look to get rich. Do it because that's what you want to do. 
but you need to spend some seasonal time and just explore the opportunities that are out there if there's any way possible. It's tough to get on, tough to get on seasonal. It's even worse to try to get on permanent. Just the positions just aren't there. But as far as trying, is this the type of work you want to do? Is this where you want to be? Because to me, they, you know, the life, the life, you know, the life of working in the park service, it's second to none. It, you know, it's it's the best career you can have. I was extremely fortunate. Uh, I worked at Biscayne early when I was a seasonal. Then from there, I worked, you know, I came back to Mammoth Cave as a three-step nine because of a rate of a previous pay. What is that? Can you explain that, Pete? Or we can... Well, I, I started at Mammoth Cave as a GS4, and then a couple of years, a couple of seasons later, I became a GS5, which means you have more responsibility on your tours. That's, that's kind of the way they did it. More money, a little bit more money. And uh, when I went to Florida at Biscayne, that was, I had to come back as a GS3 because I had missed the summer before. They had changed the way they were bringing people in. So all new hires had to come in as GS3. But because my previous rate of pay was a GS5, they couldn't pay me less than that. So they had to pay me as a GS3 step nine. So I was making more money than the GS5s were, but I couldn't take a tour by myself. I had to have a GS5 with me on the tour. So there were one day, uh, Mac Neal Van Meter from Brownsville and I were doing the lantern tours and he, we were doing it that year. We did them five days a week and he would take one. He would guide one and I would guide one. We split them off. And one day, first, first trip went out and, it was my turn. I, was, I said, well, I'll, I'll take it. We had done this years past, but I had missed that one, one summer. And so I, I went out with the tour, and well, we were gone. And uh, next thing I know, I, when I get back, he says, well, Lewis has climbed my behind. I said, why? He said, because I'm walking up there in the, in the lobby in the, in the visitor center, and he asked me where the, where the lantern tour is. And he looked, and he said, well, I looked at my watch. He said, hmm, it's about Chief City. And, uh, and he said, McNeil, you got to be the only one that can guide that. Nobody else can. We got, um, am I getting too deep into that one? <laughs> no, 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 no. That was that was good. No, I just think it's it's interesting how people get into uh, and, and yeah, and what you would tell people to do because it sounds like you're. I mean, it's like it's life. It's evolutionary. You've learned as you've gone on. Mm -hmm. You've had good training. Well, see, I, I had a I had a bachelor's degree in business administration. Now, do you do you think people say, no? Well, I've got one in forestry. Well, so what? You know what? What, what does that? What does that do? In in mine, the business the business side of it really kicked in when I was doing working the concession side of it. I've been let's see. I've not worked the maintenance division anywhere in that, but I I grew up operating farm machinery all my life and making repairs of that stuff. So I'm doing that, and and I spent you know a year and a half in Vietnam in an armor unit, and and a good part of that in the motor pool making repairs to blown up tanks and that sort of thing. So, I mean, the, me the mechanical side of it, uh, I'm, I'm used to, you know, be, you know, help rebuild a house with my dad, that sort of stuff. I see the carpentry side of it and that, that sort of thing. So, you know, I, I don't really miss anything not, not being in the maintenance side, but, you know, I, I spent a lot of time in my career, you know, uh, administrative type positions and in supervisory positions, uh, basically working for, you know, for the superintendent, and I think that's one real key that people need to keep in mind is the superintendent is the one that operates the park. So it's what is it? What does the superintendent want? And I've told several of them, as long as it's not immoral, fattening, or illegal, we'll go for it. And it seemed like almost every superintendent that came through Mammoth Cave, he had another role that he wanted me to fill, and and I did. And it and it's worked out. They paid me for it. Mm -hmm. I mean. How many people can, can say that they worked their park service career primarily in one park from a GS3 to a GS13 and then retired? I looked at, uh, I was offered the regional safety manager's position by Bob Deskins in at Atlanta several years earlier. And he, now he's, he's, he's gone now, he's, he's dead and he's gone. But he, offered, he, wanted the, he, he knew me and he wanted me in that position. And I looked at it, and my wife looked at it with what she was doing and what I was doing. It was going to take a financial beating, and we'd be have a lot longer commute. My wife's job would be totally different, and everything. And I told him, I said, you know, Bob, I said, I just don't see it. I said, it, it's going to be financially beating for us. And he didn't like it. Nobody ever told him no, but I did because 
just going down there to fill my ego wasn't going to do any good. I mean, it would have been it would have been a, a, an improvement in salary, but it would have been all eaten up and every and all your other costs in the metropolitan area of Atlanta. And I thought, I'm better off to stay right where I'm at. So we built this house that we're in today. We built it in '92. Been here since. So now it's time to downsize. But anyway, that's another story. <clears throat> This park, right now, and mostly I've been concentrating my interviews with, with the working culture of, of Mammoth Cave folks, and, and they all love it in, for different reasons. You've had a little bit, you know, you were away for a while. The culture of this park, do you think it's a, it's just the idea that you've spent a, all these years here and you've cultivated what you have here? Is there something special about Mammoth Cave as, as far as you know? As opposed to other parks that you had heard about, or um, is it is it the is it the cave itself? Is it the, just the people? I I, I think it, I think it's a combination of things. A lot of people come to Mammoth Cave and they leave, and then lots of times they try to come back. And if you know, you, and it's not just the work environment eight hours a day; it's also the community around it. You know, some of them may be from the area, and then a lot of them haven't been from the area. But, you know, if you've ever gone to a guides reunion, those people are from everywhere, and they, they just love it. They said that some of the best best times of their life was when they were working at Mammoth Cave. And you look at the community around it, you know, it's not like that you've got to get in a car and drive a half a day to go get a gallon of milk. I mean, everything that you want was within a short, you know, short drive. You know, whether you're living in the park, you know, which not many people do, or living somewhere outside of the park, and you know, culturally, uh, there's a lot of things to do. Uh, it's just, it's just a, you know, it's, it's it's a neat area. You know, people say, well, Kentucky's backward. Well, yeah, but we some of us wear shoes once in a while, so it it, it it's and it, but it's it's good people. You know, for the most part, the people are there to do the right thing for the right reason, and that was one thing that I always wanted our people to do. You know, do what we need to do, but do the right thing for the right reason. You know, don't worry about the rest of it. Lead by example. Right? Well, you know, when I was division chief, if you had a problem with one of my employees, you took it up with me. You did not take it up with them. You tell me what was going on. I'd, I'd, I'd look into it. I would make the if there was a fix to be made, I'd make it. But you didn't. You didn't start. You didn't take off on my employees to them. No, you just it was not not allowed. And it was one division chief that I ran out of the out of the office one day when he started doing that, and I just. And I told my people, don't tell anybody about it. Just leave it alone, let it die. And he goes out and tells everybody about it. So I thought, well, I'm sorry. But, you know, we, he didn't, they didn't, no one hear, heard it from us. We just let, we just let it go. But, again, you, you, could, you could fuss with me, but you can't fuss with my people. You've seen a lot of changes in the Ranger evolving, and you've laid out in the last almost an hour the, how different supervisors and, and superintendents change things. And what do you think? Do you have any thoughts about the future? I know you've been away for a few years as retired. You came back, retired when I was away from Kentucky for a while. But what do you think about the future? Do you have, I mean, what do you, you have hopes or dreams or forecasts? Well, I, you know, I think while when I was at, when I was working at the park, I think there are some things that we probably did that weren't the right things to do but you know hindsight's always 2020 and so you know to go back and say well we did this for the wrong reasons maybe uh but at the time we thought it was we thought it was the right thing to do and i think that that's going to continue you know, as long as you got people involved with it that's going to happen uh you know right now there's there's concern about the hotel and and the changes being made there uh uh because they haven't had a real long-term contract in some time. And so there's some changes that are going to be made there. Some room's going to be taken out. Will it work? Well, I don't know. But, they, you know, supposedly, the, from what I understand, what I've read in the reports from the Park Service, they've done their homework to, to say, hey, you know, we think that, that Plan A is going to work. Well, you won't know until you get into it whether it will or not. Who, who, who knows any different? You know, the, the traveling public is, is pretty fickle. And in Cave City, you, you you look at what Cave City is today and what it was 20 years ago. It's all different. How so? You've got more rooms, more places to accommodate 
tourists and that sort of thing that we didn't have. At one time, Mammoth Cave was a destination. Well, now right now it's more of a pass-through. And you have room, you have some rooms there and that sort of thing. You have things for people to do. But, you know, you don't have a swimming pool. You know, you, a, lot of, a lot of these things that these kids are looking for, you know, game rooms, that sort of thing, they're not there. They won't be there. At least I don't think they will. At least, you know, under the current guidelines that I worked under, they, they wouldn't be there because they're not appropriate for a national park. It, you've got to get got to get people and got to get kids out from in front of the TV or off their telephones or iPhones or whatever to, to, to get out and, and see what's really out there and what, what makes the world tick. Do you have any final thoughts I'd like to, do you want to share with me before we conclude? I've, you know, I've been, I've enjoyed, I enjoyed my career at Mammoth Cave and, you know, and when I retired, uh, I retired. Uh, I, ne I never went back every, every week or every two weeks for coffee with the gang or anything like that. I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to retire, I need to make up my mind that I'm ready to retire and I need to do it. And, and that, and that's what I've done. You know, it's not that, I went away mad. I didn't. You know, I didn't go away upset at anybody. I didn't. I don't think they did with me. But it was when you time to make. You need to make that break because the people that are still there, still working, need to do the things that they're trained to do that they've been doing. They don't need extra baggage coming in there looking over their shoulders because I'm out of the picture anymore. And I think when you retire, retire. Go go do something else. We we accumulated a, several rental properties, and that's that, that, that keeps me quite busy. So. I'm, I'm now I'm, I'm ready to let those go. But you know, people that want to get if, if you can if you can even get into the door of the park service, it's good duty, it really is, and it's good people.